Welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast, made for women who want their healthiest years to be ahead of them, not behind them. Join your host, Courtney Townley, right now as she breaks down the fairy tale health story you have been chasing all of your life into sensible action steps and lasting change. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast. This is your host, Courtney Townley, as always. Thank you for being here. Um, if you listened to the show last, the last episode that dropped, that was 363, I had let you know that we had had this crazy storm come through Missoula, and it ripped up so many trees and did so much damage. And part of that damage was the roof on our house and losing electricity and water. Um, and all that to say, it's been resolved. But during the recording of this episode, I had a lot of people working on the house. (laughs) So there is banging and clanging and all kinds of fun noise in the background. Um, I do have a genius and audio engineer who I am sure took care of most of it. But I'm just preempting this show by saying if you hear some background noise, that is why. Um, Again, I did the best I could, but circumstances were such that I could not completely avoid uh, having background noise. So apologies in advance. Now, the title of this episode today is called The Grief Journey, Midlife Challenges and Emotional Healing. And the reason that I wanted to speak to this topic is because midlife is really a period that is marked by so much opportunity to experience grief. And I say that largely from personal experience, but also working with so many midlife women who are grieving a lot of different things. So some of them are grieving the loss of loved ones or the loved loved ones being diagnosed with certain um, illnesses or challenges. Um, we certainly are grieving some maybe missed opportunities in our lifetime at midlife or just feeling the passing of time in itself is a grieving process. I feel that way every day my son gets out of bed. I look at him and I just think, oh my word, how, where is the time gone? I feel like I'm feeling grief every day as a mother (laughs) that my son is getting older. Um, We also find ourselves having to let go of a lot of things that no longer work for us or maybe never did. And there's a, a level of grief that goes with that. There is a shift in expectations of ourselves, of the world around us. And there's certainly a lot of navigating changes in our relationships with our loved ones. And all of this is happening for many of us at midlife, and all of this presents us with opportunity to experience grief. So this episode today is going to do a deep dive into the multifaceted nature of grief in midlife and its really profound effects on our emotional and mental well-being. And I am not a grief expert by any stretch of the imagination. I have, however, found that nearly every client I have ever worked with is grieving something as we're working together. And so it is an unavoidable topic. But to help us have this conversation today, I wanted to invite somebody in who was more experienced in this conversation. And I'm invited back to the show, Claire Schultzbergman, who some of you may remember from last year. Claire has been a longtime member of my community. She's been a longtime client, and she is a therapist. She is a social worker. She is a health and wellness coach. Um, She wears a lot of different hats. Um, But she not only has the education to have this conversation on a deeper level, But she also is going through her own grief process. If you listen to the podcast episode I did with her last year, she very generously shared her experience of being recently diagnosed with ALS. And in this episode today, we're going to talk a little bit about that and the grief process, what that's looked like for her in the face of this diagnosis. So there's a lot baked into this episode today. Um, If you are currently rumbling with your own grief, this episode is for you. But also to every listener, grief is coming for you, right? Grief is a part of life. And you may not be in a space of that right now, but you will be in a space of grieving something sometime probably soon. 
And so I hope that what we share and what we talk about in this episode today can just help you navigate whatever grief you face presently or in the future with a little bit more ease and grace. All right, let's get to it. Hi, Claire. Welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here. Now, this is not the first time you've been here. You came on, was it last? It was last year where you and I did a specific episode all about um, health in the face of dis ease. Yep. And yes. we kind of talked about what that means and um, how we can still honor our self care and our emotional health and all of the things, um, regardless of our diagnoses or illnesses or things of that nature. And you very openly shared your diagnosis with ALS. Um, so, and I really encourage listeners to go back and listen to that episode. I can't tell you right now what episode number it is, but we will put it in the show notes so people can link to it because I think it's such an important conversation. But the reason I invited you back today um, was to really have a conversation about grief. Yeah. And really from, like, the reason I wanted to have this conversation specifically with you is because I think you offer a really unique perspective because you you face grief in so many different dimensions. You are a therapist. Mm -hmm. You are a woman in midlife. You are going through your own grieving process. Yes. And so for all the reason, those reasons, I just thought that you would be the perfect person to have this conversation with. Oh, um, so before we launch into it, what do you want listeners to know about you in case they have never heard of you before, they haven't listened to previous episodes mm -hmm. with you? Yeah. So I am just a normal midlife woman. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, you're pretty exceptional, but you can call it normal. <laughs> I I am someone who has worked in the mental health field for the past 23 years, I think it is now, but also in the health and wellness industry as a group fitness instructor. And um, currently I'm teaching cycling, still teaching cycling. You are. And yoga. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I ran an adoption agency for 20, 18 years, and that's where I got into grief work. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I have, I have two adult children and a husband and yeah, a normal life. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I was diagnosed. Oh, and the unnormal thing, the abnormal thing, <laughs> is that I was diagnosed with ALS in uh, November of twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. So, because this podcast is really geared towards midlife women, I think that we have a lot of outliers, right? People of all ages listen to the show. Um, but we do have a lot of women in midlife. And I think midlife presents us with so much opportunity to experience grief. Yeah. Um, in terms of, I always, I think of grief as, for me, kind of a letting go, a release of attachment. Um, it's, there's a level of acceptance mm -hmm. um, for things shifting and changing. Mm -hmm. um, but when I think of grief at midlife, I think of grieving that our physiology is changing, right? There's a level of grief that goes along with that. And certainly with a diagnosis like ALS, that's a whole nother level of grief right. that goes yeah. with that. There's, I think, a grief I hear a lot in conversations with clients around missed opportunities yes. or grief around feeling like they they maybe wasted time or didn't pursue certain things. Right. Um, a lot of grief around parents passing, parents aging, children leaving. Mm -hmm. um, what comes to mind for you when we think of midlife grief? One of the things while you were talking is just the, the identities that we hold up until things like parents dying and children leaving and new diagnoses. I, I feel with grief, like grief is, a, grief is an emotion. Grief is with us always. And any kind of change can bring about grief. So it may be a death or it may be the choice to change jobs. It may be a child leaving and becoming an empty nester. All of those health diagnosis, all of that change can bring a, about the feeling of loss and just the emotions of grief that come up with it. Yeah. And I think what I've learned for myself and in my work is that 
each new change that kind of bring brings that grief up take I let me back up a minute I see grief kind of like an onion (laughs) and so something might happen and when another thing happens it takes another peel off the onion or or maybe like picks up the scab a little bit yeah and so grief is something that we live with and it sort of for me lives in a little corner of my heart and sometimes so I walk my life with it Sometimes it runs the show a little more than others. Sometimes if a bigger, like a diagnosis of ALS or like when my children left for college, um, for sure when my dad died, sometimes it is is bigger and takes up more of my emotional space and my mental energy. And sometimes it just is able to kind of walk alongside me in my life. Yeah. So um, that was a lot. But I, um, there's a change can bring it up and change of whatever, whatever that might be. I love what you said there about it's, um, it just walks with me through my life because I think that's so important to recognize. It's like any emotion in a, in a way, in the sense that anger is always walking with me, you know, sadness, happiness, joy, like they're always walking with us. Um, but of course, different ones are sort of brought to the surface and highlighted at different times. Right. And certainly different experiences of our life change the intensity of that emotion. Right. Um, And I also love that you mention, like, that it's, that you associate it with change. Because when I think about so much change in our life, a lot of it is conscious change. Yeah. Like, you mentioned changing jobs. Some people choose to divorce and change relationships. Yeah. Um, People change where they live. Right. And there's, it's so fascinating to me that that can be such an exciting time <laughs> and grief is still there. Right. Because yeah. there is a, as a letting go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I absolutely felt it after leaving my job of 18 years when yeah. I, I mean, there was a lot going on at that time, but leaving that job, I mean, it was a conscious and very, it was a very good decision really good for my life. And it was really sad to to do that and leave leave what I was leaving and what I had built. I think about that with divorce. I have clients who know that their divorce was the right decision and they are grieving the loss of that relationship or what they what they were hoping for in the future with their husband or spouse. So so I think it I think it is changed definitely even if it is a positive change and a very thoughtful and intentional change can yeah. still bring those feelings. And I think sometimes that throws people off. Like they think, why am I not feeling happy about this? Yeah. But, you know, that's where the curiosity comes in. So what what am I feeling and how do I respond to this? And how do I take care of myself in the midst of knowing that I did something that I know is right for me and it's a both and and I'm having these feelings. Yeah. And if we're not careful, right, recognizing and honoring that it's there and it's there for good reason, we can yeah. do all kinds of crazy things to avoid feeling it, right? right? We distract ourselves. We numb ourselves. We we have a lot of mental chatter about what it means to grieve and why it's wrong. And all of that, of course, just creates a lot of unnecessary suffering. Yeah. And and the other thing with grief, you know, I I, I'm, I see a lot of clients who have had death and and come to me because there's been a death that they're grieving. But our culture doesn't view, I mean, we are, we get what, three days to get over somebody's death, three days of bereavement at work, and then we're back at it. And our culture doesn't allow us to have the time and space to grieve something that in the way that works best for us. And so we as people, and whether we're talking about death or something else that maybe the culture doesn't even think we should grieve, like an intentional decision, we need to be the ones who put those boundaries around ourselves. We need to pull back if we need to pull back. We need to um, give ourselves a little, if if we can, maybe a, a little more mental health days. Um, maybe if we do need to go back to work, we don't overschedule ourselves after work. So yeah. we are really 
gentle and kind and compassionate to ourselves during these times. I really hear advocating for yourself in that, right? Because you might not, you know, the parameters of your job or whatever it may be may not be conducive to that, like in terms of how many days off you get for bereavement. But right. asking for what you need and and advocating for that, I think is 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 so important. Because yeah. in, there is no there is no timeline, there is no certainty to grief. There is no like, oh, two weeks and you'll be fine, right? right. But it's over right. in, a, in a certain period of time. So let's back up for a second. And with, like, with grief, because I always think of emotions as messengers. They're, right, we remove the good or the bad label and really just think about the intel that emotions are offering us. And when you experience grief and you work people, you help people through their own grief, how do you think about grief? Like, how do you, what do you think is the message there in part? Like, why is it showing up? I mean, yes, it's loss. Yes, it's change. Yeah. I think it's different. I think, it, I think it's different for everyone. And I think it's different based on what the, what the circumstance is. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's why it's important to feel and listen to and just pay attention to what comes up when we're in that state of, and I, oftentimes people aren't even labeling it as grief. They're just kind of telling me, you know, here's how I've been feeling. I've been feeling down. I've been feeling really irritable, like all of these things. And we come to the kind of mutual agreement that probably what they're feeling is grief. And so then the the next step is to get really curious about it. So that is, that's the time to kind of listen for what this message is. I've had a lot of people who are, and, and me for one too, my dad died suddenly in an accident and a couple of my clients, same thing, sudden, sudden death. And, um, they have, and I, have wanted to make some sort of meaning out of that life or out of my life because we never know when this is going to end. Mm-hmm. Um, so meaning is whatever that is to the person, mm-hmm. that might be the message that's here in grief, is how can we make some meaning out of this? Yeah. 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 And, and, and really, it's, it's asking the question. Right. Mm-hmm. What yeah, meaning and do allowing, I on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And allowing, just being really open for allowing whatever to come up, to come up without judgment, mm-hmm. without, you know, criticism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always think of that quote that grief is the price of love. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's even with things that I just, I don't really feel like maybe I did love, like leaving a job. <laughs> right? That maybe towards the end, I wasn't as in love with it as the day I accepted the job. And yet there is a letting go. It's letting go of the people I worked with. It's letting go of the routine. It's letting go of possibility in that, you know, in that position. But there is, like, I think grief is also a signal just that you cared. Yeah. You cared yeah. about something. And that's yeah. a beautiful thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That might be the biggest message of it. Yeah. So can we speak a little bit about your grief with ALS and like what that has looked like and like your, because I'm sure it changes every day. Yeah. It's so. And yeah. also like, what are some tools that you're utilizing to help you maneuver through this? Because it's not like just a complete thing, you know, it's not... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Like your, like you said, your father passed away suddenly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and grief was definitely waiting for you. And this is like a an ongoing. And you're grieving your dad is an ongoing process as well. Please don't hear me not saying like saying otherwise. But I think that there's there's a different ongoing process with your diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think. You know, it's really interesting. Elizabeth Keebler-Ross has the five stages of grief, Mm -hmm. and they are um, sort of, there's controversy around them now, but I think they're kind of a good place to start. Um, And just for reference, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. 
And when I think about my diagnosis, I'm sure that denial, well, I still probably feel that denial is still here. Like my brain oftentimes doesn't, my body often, wait, what is it? My brain oftentimes doesn't realize that my body has ALS. So I think I can do all these things and then I go to do them and it's very difficult and I, I recognize that I'm limited. So the grief surrounding this diagnosis has has hit me really s- strongly at times and then at other times it's there but it's not as it's not running the show so over memorial day i crashed my bike and i broke my ribs and i um ambulance to the er even though i told my husband that we should take an uber <laughs> <laughs> he was like, you can't get up. So we're yeah, taking I'm really ready to listen to you, right? So, but that I think was the f- biggest after the diagnosis was the biggest um, significant time of grief that I felt in since I've been diagnosed mm-hmm. because I was, so the ALS is affecting my arms and I was really unable to use my arms at that time. And it gave me a glimpse into what my future is going to be like. Mm-hmm. And so there was a lot of just um, feeling really sad and not feeling like I wanted to do anything but sit on the couch, you know. And when friends reached out, I didn't really want to see friends. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's, in those acute times, I think that there is a time and a place to pull back Mm -hmm. and to sit on the couch and watch TV if you need to and, you know, do all the things. And then... There is a time to find activities that kind of get get you out of the slump. So things for me are the things that that we've talked about that are better to do than the things that we numb with. Mm-hmm. I call them feel good activities versus false good activities. Mm-hmm. So my feel good activities are like going on a walk or um, reading a book or doing yoga, meditating, those kind of things. False good activities being drinking wine and watching yeah. TV and, you know, yeah. um, shopping, you know, things like yeah. that. And so what I try to do when I'm feeling it come up a little bit more is find one of those activities that I can do that I know will kind of, it, at least for a little while, help me feel more grounded and better with what is going on in this moment. Yeah. And how do you recognize when maybe you're marinating a little bit too heavily in the sitting on the couch and struggling, you know, not wanting to get off? Like, where, like, how do you know when it's it's too much? Like, you need to reach out and ask for help. You need to get yourself out. You need to put apply some effort to sort of shift the dynamic. Yeah. Like, is there a trigger for you, or is there like a signpost for you on that? For for me, and and this is different, I think, for everyone sure. too. But I I don't know how to say it any other way than this. But I get really sick of myself. Like yeah. I get really tired of feeling like you know. Just I I don't I like to move. I like to engage. I'm not an extrovert, but I like to kind of have c- connection with people and. When I'm in those states, I I feel like I like I can do it for so long, and then I'm like, okay, now I have to reach out, or now I have to get off the couch and go do something else. Yeah, I think for other people that I've worked with, they might have like a, a somebody who lives with them that just says that they're worried about them, or they might have to do something else because their job is on the line or their responsibilities come tap it on their door. Yeah. Um, so I think that that depends really a lot on on what is going on with the person. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it can be such a hard place, right? When we're deep in the throes of our grief, knowing like we are getting tired of it, but also needing to apply effort, whatever that looks like for you to kind of wor- work your way out of it, um, to be more proactive around it, that can feel like such an impossible place. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think, again, this goes, I don't hierarchy grief at all. I think that if something, if a, 
job change may not feel as significant to me. It could feel like the most significant thing to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But there are like, there are some things that I just said I don't hierarchy it, but I'm going to hierarchy it for here a minute. (laughs) Because I I think like the death of my dad was way bigger than leaving my job. Yeah. And if you're in, if a person is in a really significant grief, there is, there's no timeline on that. And there's, there is the kindness and the self-compassion is to take the time that you need to yeah. kind of get through that. Sit on the couch as much as you want to in the beginning in that acute time. Yeah. But eventually life continues and people start to realize that they need to move forward in some way. And then that might be talking to friends, reaching out to a counselor or a coach or a therapist, finding a grief group, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. It, it's amazing how many clients I've talked to over the years who've gone through, you know, deep grief, um, loss of loved ones, um, loss of just anything that really mattered to them and how tired they are on the other side and not under, like just completely dissociating from that, like not understanding that the, that, that the fatigue and the low energy and all of that, of course, I always say that grief is a very resource heavy emotion, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It, requ- it requires a lot of us to experience it. And I think that that's where a lot of compassion comes in yeah. and, you know, recognizing that self-care in the face of that kind of grief looks very different from self-care in a space where it's walking, like you said earlier, walking alongside of you, but it's not necessarily running the show. Yeah. And imagine if you're in that really acute grief time, regardless of what stemmed, what caused it. If you if you're judging yourself, if you're holding yourself to I should be through this by now, I sh- this shouldn't still be bothering me, what in the world is wrong with me, like all of that negative self talk, yeah, that's what's exhausting too. So it's already exhausting because grief is exhausting, yeah. and then to add all of that really strong inner critic grief talk mm-hmm. or uh, judgment on it. That just makes it even more exhausting. So on the end, on the opposite side, whenever, and I don't even know that we, you know, get, we don't definitely don't get over it. We walk through it. And then we kind of like, I said, kind of carry it along with us, a little smaller package. If we can get curious about what this is telling me, how does this actually feel? How does this grief actually feel in my body? So then if we have another moment that triggers it, we can go, oh yeah, this is grief probably. And what did I do that helped me back then? Okay, I need to find my feel-good activities and go walk in nature or talk to my friend or sit and cry, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. When we get curious and we offer ourselves that self-compassion, that's what's going to allow us to be on the other side of that acute phase and be feeling like we have a little more resources to move forward in life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think guilt too, right? Like there's this guilt that comes with when we have been processing our grief. And like, I love how you said it there, like it just becomes a little bit of a smaller package. I think sometimes we can get caught up in this feeling of guilt that it's becoming a smaller package. And so it's almost like we fight for it to come back because we think that it's a way of honoring whatever we've lost. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. And um, I, again, that's a lot of thought work, which you alluded to, because what, what I've heard so far is like we make grief unnecessarily hard when we judge ourselves, when we make it mean terrible things, when we buffer. So we, yeah. again, numb ourselves or distract ourselves with things that chemically alter us. Can you think of any other ways that we make grief unnecessarily hard? You had a really good list. Oh! There are a few good things on there. Yeah, I, I think, I think maybe just the denial that grief might be what we're feeling when we're, when we're in those moments that don't, that aren't like really obvious you should feel grief because somebody died like that's just so obvious like yeah. you know if somebody close to you dies you lose that person grief yes that makes sense but 
if we don't recognize that we have grief in those other kind of less obvious times, I think that makes it harder too. Definitely. I think self-neglect makes it hard too. And and I I do realize, right, like administering self-care when you are deep in the throes of grief, of course, has its challenges because we don't want to apply effort. We're low on resources. But even maybe the unwillingness to ask for help, to ask for support, to have someone cook you a meal, to have yep. someone take your dog for a walk, right? Like just that, that maybe is in part what self-care really looks like when we're deep in the throes of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. A really, if for me, because my, my, the changes with the ALS are coming fairly slowly, thank goodness. I still have the need for people to help me with things. And that's been a big thing for me to get through because I, I'm independent. I want to do things myself. Yeah. So, yeah, somebody once said to me, the greatest act of love is allowing someone who loves you to do something for you in mm. those moments. Yeah. And I was like, that's true. Like the people who want to help, they want to help. So allow them to help. Yeah. Here's my tip for the people who are wanting to help. Choose something to do instead of ask what somebody needs because asking the grieving person what they need yeah. makes that person have to think about what would be helpful. Yeah. And sometimes in that acute phase of grief, and even if it's just something that feels like it's going on for a long time, like my stuff, I feel like it's here all the time. I don't have the energy to think about, okay, it would be really helpful if someone would pull my <laughs> you know? So like, look at my garden and know that I might, I need my weeds pulled. <laughs> yeah. Take Come initiative. On, yeah. Take initiative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm curious too, because support, like having a support network is so important mm-hmm. um, to help us move through our grief and also just to help support us while we take that time to grieve because no one can do that grief for us, right? That's our work. <laughs> But what would you say to somebody who really just feels kind of alone in their grief? Like they don't know where to reach out or they don't know how to create a support network. Like what would be maybe some tips for that? Yeah, I mean, I there's lots of online grief groups. Yeah. And they, oh, I really, I can't remember this. There's one that is specifically has several different groups for several like pet loss and different things that don't feel necessarily like the traditional thing you would spend time in a grief group for yeah but you can just you can look up you can google grief group pet loss job loss whatever it is and you can come up with some some groups and that might feel safer in the beginning to be a little less a little removed from from the so sitting with somebody like a counselor, a therapist, yeah. or um, a friend, and talking about these things. Yep. But I think that it's so important to have that community, whatever way you can find it. So reaching out in that way would be really beneficial for somebody. Yeah. What have been your maybe strategies that you've used for kind of processing your grief? Like, has it been talk therapy? Has it been journaling? Has it been your yoga and meditation? Like all the above? All of the above. All the above. Yeah. Yeah. But I've noticed that writing, there are moments, well, I can't write anymore. It's dictating. My, (laughs) I don't, I can't even read what I write when I write um, because my hands don't work. But There are words and feelings that flow that feel like they need to come out at times. And then other times my journal just is over to the side and I don't even look at it for a long period of time. Yeah. For me, I've, I mean, I've done a couple fundraisers. So for me, it's getting active and trying to like do something about this. So that might be really good for somebody who is like, you know, somebody was lost for drunk driving or even like, you know, if a child is diagnosed with a disability or a learning disability, something like that, that that can bring bring grief for what could have been or what the idea of how life was going to go with this family member. Yeah. And so maybe that person gets involved in advocating for programs or groups or whatever for children that are like theirs. So I think getting active 
perspective can be one thing that could be helpful too. Yeah. Um, that's also something that could make meaning out of whatever's going on. Yeah. But yeah, meditation, that's a grounding thing for me. Yoga certainly is. Um, definitely, I've reached out to you. I've reached out to my therapist when I have acute times that, like after I broke my ribs, yeah, I was like, I need to talk to my therapist. Yeah. Because, you know, it's... So I think all of those things are um, are helpful. And it, again, really depends on what the person feels like they're ready to do and willing to do and has helped in the past for that person. Yeah, it's what you and I, I mean, you know, talk about so often, which is like, even in grief, we have to be willing to run experiments because... Mm-hmm everyone's process is so wildly different. And what you need in one moment of grief is probably wildly different from what you need in another moment of grief. Right. And so it is that kind of that willingness to, to just dip your toe in the water and, and see what does work for you. Yeah. And, and the way to kind of start doing that is to just, again, get really curious about what's happening now. So when, and, and that means presence. So in the day, throughout the day, just getting like, how am I feeling? Checking in. We talk about this all the time. Yeah. Checking in and saying, how do I feel now? What do I need? What is the wisest and kindest thing I can do for myself? Mm-hmm. And how do I feel? Okay, I'm feeling pretty good. Okay, well, what is going on right now? I'm outside. I'm talking to my friend. Okay, these are things that need to go on your feel-good list. Yeah. Because you know that you that whatever it is that you're feeling okay right now, yeah. Take note of what you're doing, where you are, who's around you. Yeah. And then same with like, I'm really feeling crappy right now. Well, what happened? Yeah. Well, I ate a sugar cereal for breakfast and sugar cereal for lunch and sugar cereal for dinner. <laughs> like, you know, so maybe yeah. that's not the best thing, yeah. you know? So paying attention to all of that is really important. Then you have your list of what can help get you through. And I think you really need to have it on a list. So it's super easy to... To look at when you're yeah. in those moments where you are, can't think of what anything that's going to make you feel better, you can just look at your list. Yeah. It's so funny. Like when I do thought work with clients, right, they they always tend to want to gravitate towards the negative in terms of like, okay, well, I'm feeling bad because I'm having all these negative thoughts. And it's like, okay, but recognize what makes you feel good. Like let's, let's go for the quality of that thinking too, because it just gives you evidence for how powerful focusing on that, those different thoughts is. And that's, I I hear that echoed here for sure, um, which is so powerful. So yeah, being willing to experiment, taking note of kind of what helps you to, to bring a little life back into your life Mm -hmm. and, and help you heal. Cause that's really what we're talking about, right? Is, is that healing? Yeah. As you were talking to, I thought of that one of my favorite questions, because I just feel like it always realigns me so fast is what would love do here? Yeah. And in grief, when I'm in the throes of it, what would love do here? She would she would put me to bed. She would help me take a bath. She would feed me. She yeah. would, you know, like maybe run her hand through my hair and just really be nice to kind to me. Yeah. And um and I think that yeah, that's And what happens is we let judgment come in. And I talked about this earlier, but if we're, you know, oh, I should be getting off the couch and like making the dinner and folding the laundry, doing all the things, love is going to tell me I actually need to just put myself to bed. Totally. So, yeah, I think that's really good. She's so wise. Love is so wise. wise. (laughs) She really is. And we rarely let her run the show, right? We let, all, like you said, the judgment, the self-doubt, the all the other stuff. And just, it is, it's such a, I feel like it's the ultimate self-care question, right? Like if you're ever rumbling with knowing how to take care of yourself, what would love do here? It's yeah. a great one. Yeah. So any any final words for what you would want an audience member to hear in terms of grief? I just think that I just want everyone to really understand that that the grief having grief in your life is normal. And there is nothing wrong with you if you grieve something that the culture thinks is, you know not something that deserves this gigantic emotion of grief. 
Um, because the other thing is grief is, doesn't always, we've talked about this too, doesn't always have to be gigantic. So if there's little, if there's something that just feels off, maybe getting curious about it and, you know, asking the questions, am I feeling, what am I feeling here? Maybe it is grief. What does that mean? I, I don't only, I'm a, I'm a, I am certified in grief therapy, but I don't only see people who come after death, but I think every single one of my clients has some form of loss in their life. And therefore we talk about grief. Yeah. Life is grief, right? It's a constant letting go and changing and all the things that we've talked about today. And I, I read somewhere, like if you gave me the option between like a life with no grief or a life with grief, I would choose grief every time. Because what does it say about your life to never experience grief? Right. You never cared about anything. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And you can't feel the really beautiful feelings of joy and peace and um, no excitement if you're not allowing yourself to feel the, the more difficult feelings. hundred percent. So, um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's really what I've learned through just my life, through this diagnosis, through the death of my dad, through working with all of my people, is to just get really, really curious when something is here that feels interesting, that feels like it might, like, I could be like, I don't want to feel this today. Okay, well, what is going on? How does it feel? What am I thinking? We talk about this all the time. Yeah. Thought work. Yeah. It, it's sort of a scary thing to lean into grief, but it can really be peaceful and it can be information giving and so mm-hmm. all of that. I, I really it doesn't have to be scary. Yeah. I love that you mentioned that because I, I do so often when I'm working with clients who are avoiding grief, right? They're drinking and they're eating and they're doing everything but feeling their grief. The rationalization for that is if they allow themselves to feel it, they'll never pull out of it. That's the point. A hundred percent. When my dad died, I thought, if I allow myself to feel this, I'm going to drop to my knees and I will never get up. Yeah. And I allowed myself to feel it eventually. I mean, there was a moment where I was like, I don't, you know, this is too much. And I think that feeling, that allowing has, it's like building a muscle. It's like that allowing has then made me go, okay, I got through the worst of what I thought could happen. He went on a vacation, never came home. It was pretty traumatic. And now, okay, now there's going to be more grief in my life. My other people will die. I got diagnosed with this terminal illness, all of these things. But I know that I made it through what I thought was going to put me out for good. Yeah. And so there's, you build that, that muscle to be able to tolerate it more and more. One of the things that is interesting when we talk about people avoiding, when I worked in adoption, I worked with birth mothers who were placing their babies for adoption. And yeah. that is so, I mean, it, there's grief all over the place oh, in the adoption yeah. world. And for the women who did not allow themselves to feel the depth of what the the feelings were that were there, it'll come out crooked somewhere. Like yeah. it, it, I would sit in court with them and they wouldn't be able to get through court because they had not felt all the grief that led up to that point. Yeah. It might be a year after that. It might be five years after that. But if it's stuffed down, somehow, some way it will come up. So that to me is the, and it will come up in a way that is way worse than probably what's feeling right now. Yeah. So that to me is why I really want to help people when they come to me to walk through that with them and to kind of help them understand what to expect and help them be kinder to themselves and all of those things Mm -hmm. so that they don't have it come up crooked when they're, you know, in the least possible, the, the least, the time when they really don't want it to come out. Yeah. It's just... Well, better for people. Definitely. 
And can, like considering the work of like Gabor Mate, right, who talks a lot about the correlation between yeah. the stuff that we're unwilling to feel mm-hmm. and then the autoimmune challenges and all the yeah. things that, you know, like saying that someone died of a broken heart, like that is a real mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. that 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 we, yeah. if we don't process it in healthy ways, we don't find the support networks, we don't learn how to navigate it in a way that keeps us well, we can get ourselves into a whole lot of trouble. Right. Yeah. 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 I so appreciate you, my friend. Thanks for having this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I think it was a really important one. Yeah. Me too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Grace and Grit podcast. It is time to mend the fabric of the female health story. And it starts with you taking radical responsibility for your own self-care. You are worth the effort. And with a little grace and grit, anything is possible.